how did phrenology, a pseudoscience, contribute to the development of psychology? Franz Josef Gall is the father of phrenology. In 1819, he wrote that personality can be inferred from the bumps on your head. His ideas would later become known as phrenology. He felt the skulls of more than 100 family, friends, and colleagues. He concluded after his analysis that there are 27 faculties of the mind. Each one of these faculties is a function of the mind. The image on the screen depicts one of the earliest illustrations of the functions proposed by phrenologists. If you look right behind the ear, phrenologists said this area of the brain was in control of destruction. If you had unusual bumps behind your ear, Gall inferred that you were more of a destructive person than someone who doesn't have bumps behind the ear. Phrenologists believed the brain is very localized, that specific areas of the brain were in control of very, very, very specific behaviors. They also believed that everyone has the same set of 27 functions, but there are individual differences in the strength of each one. These faculties are inborn, they are innate, we are all born with them. The doctrine of the skull suggests that the strength of each of the 27 faculties depends on the bumps on the head. In addition to promoting their ideas about skull shape, phrenologists also invented tools to use in measuring skull shape bumps imperfections. This is an example here on the screen of a craniometer. It was designed to measure the distance between different parts of the brain and help determine the depth of indentations. What did they get right? Gall was correct that different parts of the brain are responsible for different functions of the mind. Different parts of the brain are responsible, at least partly responsible for different basic human functions. But the map of 27 functions, the idea that the strength of these 27 functions depends on the shape of the skull has not been supported by any research. Their reliance on anecdotal evidence, the notion that Gall felt the skulls of his family, friends, and colleagues overlooked non-supporting cases. We have to look at those cases and try to make sure our theory incorporates those cases. Phrenology remained popular in the United States and in Europe until the mid-1800s. In the early 1800s, there were two individuals who were mainly responsible for spreading the word about this particular set of ideas. Johann Spurzheim, a German physician, and George Combe, a Scottish lawyer. Both of these individuals traveled around Europe and the United States, going to different community events, setting up a tent, and bringing people into the tent, feeling their heads, and then giving them a personality profile. Unlike Gall, Spurzheim said that faculties could be shaped by early experiences. He believed that genes were not the only determinant in personality, behaviors, thoughts. This idea that we have free will and we can make decisions about the people that we become, that was very much in line with the American values and ideals at the time. The United States was growing rapidly. More and more individuals from all different parts of the world were coming to the United States. My own relatives, the Cortons, came to Illinois in 1836. My great, 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 
great-grandfather wrote a letter back home to England that year describing the farm that he had purchased in Jacksonville, Illinois. Because of this alignment, Spurzheim's version of phrenology really caught on in the United States, and it was 1860s before the scientific community was able to convince the general population that there were better theories, better alternatives to the study of the mind. <laughs>